Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This podcast is for the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, August 13, 2023. The first reading is 1 Kings 19, 9 through 18, or if you're following the semi-continuous package, Genesis 37, verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 28. We'll be looking at Psalm 85, verses 8 through 13. The epistle is Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 15, and from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 14, 22 through 33. M material, special Mathean material, Peter walking on the water. Woo! Only Woo! here, only in year A, only on Sermon Brainwave, folks. <laughs> and just to rub in the point that I made last week, here we go again. Jesus has not forgotten that he was on his way to take a little rest. And so after meeting the needs of the crowds, he dismissed the crowds and what? goes up on the mountain by himself to pray. So, so this is an important, this is important to ask for us re working preachers. But I said that last week. Well, the, the, the observation, your initial observation, Matt, that this is, you know, uniquely Mithian material is that's a, that's an important question. Like we always talk about with our preaching students, right? Joy is to, that's one of the questions as you're doing your exegetical work for a sermon and your sermon preparation, that when you have a passage that is unique to a particular gospel, the first thing you should say is why, you know, what, what, what themes, what mythi particular Mithian themes, theological, Christological, soteriological, pneumatological, ecclesiological, whatever are being, uh, are, are, being revealed in a particular, in this particular way. And so it's, a it's always helpful to say why why does Matthew care about this what and not that you want to preach a sermon on getting into the mind of Matthew that's not what I'm saying that would be really really boring but why does Matthew care about what's at stake for him um Christologically and theologically and for the and for the disciples why why is this passage important why include it and I think if the preacher starts there you you might start to you might start to have a sense of 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 that importance and why and why it's here and and also then get at uh some of the you know some of the underlying theological tenets that are really that are really key for this passage and advice this, number one yes and in this thread of 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 what is in this particular gospel being said being held to um as you've follow this narrative from beginning to end. One of the pieces um, uh, that I, I would draw us to is uh, the phrase that, that Matt dropped last week about the training wheels I love. Um, uh, the, the training wheels are still on here at verse 22. So we come into this immediately after this incredible miracle, after this incredible display of the disciples being involved in God's miraculous act, this particip participatory moment that the disciples have just had, they aren't ready to see Jesus coming up on the on on the up uh, on the waters. It's like it's like you've just seen how absolutely incredible Jesus is, and they still have doubts. So this is a continual thread of preparing the, the uh, witnesses of God to be fully able to be witnesses of God. Yeah, there's some interesting, there's, there's debates about this passage. Some people are highly critical of Peter. Uh, others really celebrate him. And so I think a preacher needs to make up their mind what you think's going on there. Uh, tone of voice matters for verse 28. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Tone of voice matters for verse 31. You of little faith, why did you doubt? Those can be, that could be very stern. It could be very gentle uh, and, and playful. And so 
uh, do your research and, and take your pick. But this gets back to the, you know, why does Matthew care about this? And I think, I think some of that has to do with Peter is probably a really important figure in this intra-Jewish debate that's part of the context um, surrounding Matthew. I wouldn't preach on that, but you can say Peter in a sense represents the wider church. Peter represents the church learning to step into its role as the as the ambassadors of Jesus in terms of their teaching ministry, they're making disciples, they're baptizing, etc. And so in that regard, Peter represents us uh, to a degree and and represents an uncertain church learning and in, leaning into or learning how to embrace that authority. So mm-hmm. um, fun to play with that. Little faith is a is a Matthean theme or at least a term that we see frequently in Matthew. Um, and it's not always a bad thing. It's it's little faith can still grow and, and do great things. And that mustard uh, seed this idea. Is the, what's that? That mustard seed idea. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and this is the gospel where when people are standing with the resurrected Jesus before his ascension, uh, they're worshiping, they're believing, and, and they're doubting. It's kind of this, this mix of, of emotions. And so I, I think most of our preachers won't talk about doubt as the enemy of faith or the opposite of faith. I think, at least I hope you're not going to do that, but, but to, to talk about what's, what's learned here, what's demonstrated here, how does this represent a life of faith? Uh, it's a story that people know, I think for the most part, even if you haven't been to church, uh, because that walking on water is, uh, is, has entered the popular vernacular, right? Of people who do extraordinary things, but um anyway yeah yeah a lot to play with here and create yeah sorry you go i'm done no i think yeah the the little the little faith i think the your your charge matt of the what the tone is for that is really important because it's it it's not that it's not that Peter doesn't have any faith. It's, and as you said, the little, and the little faith actually comes in to play. I mean, you could do, you know, you could do a word study, but that would be really fun. But, you know, we also get that in the stilling of the storm right. uh, and it, which Jesus has already done. And so it's, you know, it, it we get that claim or that little faith and moments that are really uh, how do I want to put it? Where where what's at stake is is really who what the identity of Jesus? Who is Jesus, mm-hmm. and what can Jesus do? And He's already stilled a storm, you know, the storm in chapter eight, and mm-hmm. uh, and there was the expression of little faith there, and then now He's walking on water, and so it's it's these moments where just who is this that that even the you know the seas and the winds obey Him and that that power over chaos and the power over the sea is a revelation that we get in verse 33 you they it, they worshiped him saying you are the son of god so it becomes this moment of uh of being able to identify who jesus is um and his true identity and and so i uh, it it's and it's in those moments where you a little faith having a, um, just a little faith is about all you can muster <laughs> yeah, yeah. because there's a lot of stuff going around and there's you know the wind and the sea and the and the tossing of the boat and uh, and so um, but it it is this important moment for the disciples to recognize you know and when and when Jesus says it is I right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, there's that echo of the of the of the name of Yahweh. So um, there's a lot. Yeah, here. It's a, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's oh. so much here, and and that that thread of the journey of um, you know you said that a little faith is sometimes all we can muster. Um, well, we grow in our practices of faith. We grow in our faith, and so. Um, one one way of homiletically staying in this episode is, uh, as you were saying, uh, Matt, uh, the tone of voice and that that puts the characters together. So if if we read this in a in a totally positive light, where where 
in light of everything that has been experienced that is the memory of chapter eight and the memory of, of the event just before in 14, and now a, a possible recognition uh, uh, of who Jesus is, um, Peter confidently says, and and Jesus kindly responds, pay attention to what causes that doubt. And it's a strong wind. It, it, I think that, that, sh- that description of the wind is important. It, it's not the first breeze that came along. But it's, it's the kind of strong wind that you get out on the open sea. And I'm not big out on going on water. So I, I don't, I don't experience those kinds of winds in terms of being on a boat, but I do experience those kinds of winds in terms of the reality of the world that we're living in. And most of us would recognize that we and our communities have experienced and are experiencing strong winds. And so let's be gentle in our response to saying you still are on the journey to fully recognizing who God is and what God's good intention is for you in the world. Uh, Just as Matthew is enjoying this scene, enjoy this scene uh, when you uh, uh, proclaim it with your listeners. A few weeks ago, I talked about how one of the things that Matthew seems quite concerned about, or Jesus and Matthew seems quite concerned about, are are people who create obstacles for others in mm-hmm. in their faith. We'll see some of that next week, where there's criticism of a group of Pharisees. But uh, so this that's part of the mix too, I think, for how we talk about little faith and what that looks like, and how faith grows, and how it's also a, a corporate responsibility to provide protection for those with little faith or to step up, uh, provide a hand for that. So there's, uh, again, as, as, uh, as the preacher makes their judgment about whether Peter has done something wrong here or what he's done wrong or what, how Jesus is trying to correct him or encourage him uh, to remember that too, that this is a gospel that really celebrates, well, the poor in spirit. I mean, we can start there with, a. Uh, an idea of 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 a person's uh, vulnerability or lack of a fully formed spiritual health of some whatever poor in spirit means mm-hmm. and and whatever little faith means. Mm-hmm. And I, I would add one more thing, and um, and we should go on, but that is the response is not just from Peter. Exactly. Right? It's not it's not for the sake of Peter alone. It's for the sake of this communal worshiping moment uh those in the boat said truly that you are the son of god not not peter saying truly you are the son of god but it's a a, it's a yeah a communal response in this in this interaction between peter and jesus that also becomes really important that the disciples are witnesses to this and um and and in that in that witness and in that presence then they they recognize something that they recognize the truth of Jesus identity so it's not just it's not just all about peter <laughs> it's uh for the sake of all say, people in the boat <laughs> it's for everybody in the boat yes everybody i want to take boat. that uh, um to go to an, yet another familiar text uh the first kings 19 um, where, you know, we spent uh, time, and, and I'm sure we will today, but I want to take that thread you just lifted up, Caroline, um, for the end of this passage, uh, because we read this, or I should say my experience and, and sometimes my preaching of this stops with this being about Elijah. And it's actually about what Elijah is going to do. Um, jumping down to verse 15, then the Lord said to him, go, return on your way. And when you arrive, this is what you're going to do. You're going to start anointing and you shall anoint uh, Haziel and Jehu and uh, Elisha. <clears throat> Excuse me. It, it's the, this encounter of the Lord by Elijah is not just for Elijah. And and so I, I really appreciate that thread because that point can be made 
in this familiar text in First Kings 19 as well. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's this, it's, I guess, the, if I were to include this in, in the preaching this week, it would be that these experiences that Elijah and Peter have aren't just for themselves, obviously, like, like you were both were saying, but then, you know, how does God meet us? And where is God gentle when, when circumstances demand being gentle and, and other passages and to help people get a sense of the variety that they, that scripture offers us in terms of, um, how God is presented or how God shows up in some of these moments. Cause I, I suspect people have stories of their own of sensing the presence of God, or if not the voice of God or some kind of, uh, you know, technically religious experience. Um, and to get, create space for people to be able to share those without the wider congregation thinking that there's something wrong with them. Um, in my experience, people have those stories to share, but they need to know it's a safe space to um, to let it out, especially in the kinds of churches I imagine that most of our our listeners run in that are that value respectability just as much as they value <laughs> um, present I, company included, of course. Right? You know what I mean? It's just yeah, that's a, um, like let's not get too weird here. <laughs> yeah. I th I think that's a I, I think that's a really important theme both for the Mythian text and here of of encounters with God and where we invite people to give testimony to those encounters. And they're not uniform and they're not sometimes, and, and most of the time they're just not expected. And so to give people, uh, in, to invite people into those uh, sharing of those moments, I think is great. I think the other thing about this passage that I was thinking about is that I love the question what are you doing here, Elijah? You know, yeah. What are you doing here? Well, again, tone of voice matters for that too, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Yes. What are you doing here? And and the correlate, though, what we get in this passage and what we get also in the Matthew passage, you know, what are you what are you doing here? The correlate is God saying, "Guess what? I'm here too." And uh, and so God responds to God's own question in a way: uh, "You are here, but I am also here, and I'm 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 going to you, and I'm with you." And so there's um, I think there's something there you could do with the sermon as well. All right, Genesis, or do we want to uh, talk a little bit about the Psalm as a connection? Or let's do the Psalm because I think the Psalm is keyed off of the Elijah text. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I know it's keyed off the Elijah text, but yeah. Yeah. So. Are you going to use it liturgically or something? Uh, I don't think so. Not this time. Not this week. All right. I think. Get I out think, of the liturgy entirely, people. What's that? What? Keep it out of the liturgy entirely. Is that what you're saying then? No, <laughs> no. Right. But I, uh, I, again, it's, I think it's words that you can use in a sermon, right? Let me hear what God the Lord will oh, speak yeah. and uh, and let me hear. And so that's it, that that refrain could be also part of a sermon. Let me hear God. Let me hear God when you speak. Uh, let me see you when you are here. You know, this kind of, uh, yeah, I would use it as maybe like a, a homiletical refrain could be possible. And there's no storm here. There's no rocks breaking. It's yeah. It's it's uh, fecundity, as one of our colleagues likes to say, right? Things growing and flourishing. Yeah. And, and when we're deciding on tone, for he will speak peace. He will speak to his faithful, those who turn to him in their hearts. And in each of these moments, whether it's mustering up a little faith or whether or not it's knowing why I'm here, it's those who have turned their hearts to God. And so that, that's another thread that the psalm offers, that the voice is a voice of peace. Okay, Genesis, Genesis 37. Mm. Another great little brother text. Yeah. Yeah, somebody mentioned this for for me once, and I can never forget it. And it's just how this this text opens up. It says, "This is a story of Jacob. Joseph was seventeen. Yeah, 
<laughs> but I, I've come to, in some ways, resonate that with the fact that uh, this is a story of the people of God over generations. So, so yeah, we're going to talk about Jacob by talking about his descendants. I, yeah, this is another one of these texts where it's like, where do you find something about God in here? It's, um, you know, Joseph is a kind of, well, Joseph doesn't go out of his way to make friends easily. <laughs> but, but at the same time, what happens to Joseph is obviously uh, deeply unjust. But it's the, it's not just that, I think it's not just that their father favors him clearly over them and all the problems that that creates. But there's that line, right? Here comes the dreamer, right? Let's kill him and we'll see what happens to his dreams, which, uh, which is on the plaque at the Lorraine Motel in, in Memphis where, where Dr. King was killed. That's got its own, it's part of the afterlife of this particular text. You bet. And thinking about dreamers and, and that image. But it's part of what they're resisting here. And, you know, Joseph's dream is basically they're all going to bow down to him. So I, I get why they don't like the dream. But yeah. it's, yeah. you know, Joseph is a, an essential prophet. He's the first prophet, so to speak, who's, um, whose prophecies uh, are met with violence. Right. And so that's, that's worth talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I get that Joseph's got some character issues that need to be talked about, but I don't want to discredit him so much that we miss the power of a prophecy and the power of a word from God and what that does to people who don't like it. I think, yeah. And the, the line, you know, verse 20, um, let's kill him and throw him in one of these cisterns and say that, a you know, ferocious animal devoured, but that line, then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Uh, that I think that would be my homiletical entrance into this text mm. uh, that speaks truth about how uh, about how we how how is it that we hear and listen to the dreams of the other and uh, and where is it that we um, we are so prone to squash them not only squash them but in the case of of how as you said. Uh, Matt with Martin Luther King Jr. killed them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a, an indictment of a, of a kind of sin there, I think that is worth some exploration of what it, what it is. And so it's, there's a, it, that human condition of, of our response to, um, to those those dreams that either seem out of reach or unbelievable or somehow you think you're threatened by them uh and or they don't include you or something like that so like what what is the threat what is the fear that that dream can't you can't allow that dream to come to fruition and missing the thread um or, or maybe i should say be careful not to miss the thread um the destruction here that the the brothers are planning um, is based on a falsehood. How are we going to kill him? We're going to kill him, and then we're going to say someone else did. And, and the word "plotted" here is truly what's happening. There's a plot, and it's false, and it's up against which, in hindsight, we know has been um, a confidence. I want to spell that arrogance, but a confidence that uh, Joseph had that what he had was was going to come true. And um, those of us who are confident in our ways have to be careful not to be arrogant, um, because if we are of God, I love how I say if we, um, but for those who, who are, are of God and confident in that, it's easy for that to come across as arrogance, especially when we're dealing with liars, when we're dealing with those who would cover up their acts, when we're dealing with those who, as you were saying, um, uh, Caroline, are threatened by the possibility of their loss if another would gain. 
And where God comes into this is that God has put this confidence in Joseph so that others all would be saved through a famine, through the worst of 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 a of a circumstance, and that all is not just the brothers that are plotting this evil against him, but also the enemies, the Egyptians, and and so that that fullness of the community is a part of God's intention here. Um, it's never about Joseph, just like it was never about Elijah, or it was never about. Peter. It's never about the one. It's always about the community. And, and that's another thread that I think we, we, we should not lose uh, as, as we're reading through this text and deciding how we will convey this story. Sorry. I was saying a lot, a lot of the details here are just kind of gross as well, right? They're sitting down to their meal while he's in the cistern, right? It's, they see this rich caravan, which makes them suddenly think, oh, we're going to sell him for 20 shekels. I mean, they they change their plan based on kind of what the circumstances allow and just gets like, he's, you know, you meant you call them liars and the, the deceit in here and just, they can't really figure out what they want to do to him. They just know they're, they're going to, they're going to get him out of their lives. We're going to destroy him. We're going to get him out. Yes. Yeah. And it's finally for what? 20 shekels of, you know, because the caravan looks too enticing when it comes by it, there's something in here that, and and Reuben's like half heart of the attempt at courage, and there's a lot to be said. Anyway, sorry. No, I on. I really appreciate I really appreciate you not losing that 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 map because there's so much here. And again, this ancient scene, the the brokenness, um, the evil, the sin that is in it, the lack of hospitality, the failure to discern God's will is still where we are today. And so let the let let our going in on a deep dive in this text not um not be easily my tribe versus your tribe, but let it be where are we listening? Uh, who are we and are we really discerning God's will? Um and and then you know to preach that in such a way that we have to move out of the way as preachers and let the spirit speak um, through the diversity of our congregations. Uh, hopefully, where some would would at least have a half hearted attempt to do right. Um, I, I, I there's so much here. Um, uh, yeah, yes, we should move on to Romans, but there's so much here. <laughs> yeah. All three of us. Yeah, we talked last week about Romans ten. It's it's in Romans nine to eleven. People might not realize that, but it's Romans nine ten to eleven. Uh, and I think we described it last week as really a, a Paul's meditation on the character of God, as much as it's about anything else. And so, be aware of that. Be aware that this passage uh, comes out of uh, chapter ten, verse four, where Paul describes. Uh, the, Christ as the, the the telos of the law, mm-hmm. and the Greek word telos means end, and just like the English word end has a variety of meanings, can mean com- you know last square finish line, or can have the sense of fulfillment and and completion. I I tend to think Paul is saying the latter here, not that not that Christ puts an end to the law as some you know it's no longer got any standing but rather Christ does something to the law or brings it to some kind of point of fulfillment. And then where it gets tough is Paul's got about four different Old Testament texts in here that he's that he's playing around with. Um, but I think at the heart of it is that uh, the, the Christ is here. You don't need to run up to heaven to find Christ. You don't need uh, anything else to, to encounter Christ. He said similar things about the law back in, in chapter six and seven. But for him, this is good news. This is whatever the solution is to the quote unquote problem of unbelieving Jews, unquote. Let's understand the quotes there are, you know, how to how quickly nuance this. The this whatever the solution is, and I'm not sure Paul knows exactly what's on the mind of God here, but whatever the solution is, it's centered in Christ. Uh, that Christ is not an abrogator of the law, that Christ is not um, kind of an end to Judaism. But whatever's going to happen, God has made a pledge or renewed that pledge 
in the presence of Christ.